Uh, welcome in, everybody. Happy Thursday. It is March 7, 2024. The Gamecocks are set to kick off spring practices in just over a week. So looking forward to seeing the Gamecocks out there. And on this program today, we're going to be talking a lot about some of the question marks heading into spring. Spring practices start on Tuesday, March 19th. And we've talked about it a lot this offseason. USC has really upgraded in a lot of areas as far as their depth goes, as far as experience goes. But there's a lot of positions, too. I'd say there's several, at least, that there's still a lot of question marks about. There's question marks on the defensive side. There's question marks on the offensive side. There's going to be some questions special teams-wise. Obviously, there's a change in coordinators with Pete Lumbo no longer being here. Joe D. Camillus taking over as special teams coordinator. But it's not just as simple as that. There's some changes special teams wise with Mitch Jeter no longer being with the program as he decided to transfer to Notre Dame this offseason. So there's a lot of things going on that I really want to take a deeper look at today as we get ready for spring practices to start up on the 19th. In addition to that, 15 Gamecocks are set to take part in next Tuesday's Pro Day at South Carolina. Some players who weren't even on the team last year, but a couple of years ago, Jabari Ellis been one of those. I had a chance to speak with Jabari earlier today. He's getting ready. He's excited to be back in town. So we're looking forward to talking with Jabari and not just him, but the 14 other former Gamecocks that are set to take part in Pro Day. If you missed the list, those players include, of course, the five who were out at the NFL Combine. All five are expected to take part in Pro Day. On Tuesday, but you have Marion Brown, Marcella Style, mentioned Jabari Ellis, Nick Gargiulo, D'Angelo Gibbs, Tyreek Johnson, to carry on Joyner, Trey Knox, Xavier Leggett, Eddie Lewis, Dante Turbo Miller, Spencer Rattler, Tyrese Ross, Jordan Strawn, and DJ Twitty. We're going to come back to that in a little bit because as I wrote today on Quick slants on Gamecock Central. If you're not a subscriber, sign up today for just $1. First dollar for that month. First month, $1. Can't beat that. You get everything else in between, not just football, but recruiting, basketball, baseball, you name it. We have everything, especially with basketball going on right now. Women's SEC tournament tips off for the Gamecocks uh, this weekend. And next week, you're going to have the men's tournament tipping off in Nashville, South Carolina, trying to get that double bye so that they don't have to play until Friday. But uh, as far as football is concerned, though, we will get into one player, not from the five, not including the five that were out in Indy at the NFL Combine, but one of the other players of that 10 who I'm most excited to watch at Pro Day because I truly believe this individual as an opportunity to not only raise his draft stock, but someone that could certainly be drafted if he's able to test well this week. Having said all that, though, let us know what position, what position, could be multiple positions, what position concerns you the most heading into spring practices for the Gamecocks? Where would you like to have a better sense of what direction a positional room is headed in? that you want to be able to feel more confident about. One position in particular that I feel like we'll do offense and defense here, but one position in particular that really stands out to me is the wide receiver room. Simply because when you look at USC's wide receiver room, yes, they were able to bring in three players from the transfer portal. That's, that's massive. Because when you look at what Jared Brown has done, when you look at Marion Huggins Bruce and Gage Laverdane, those three players combined have played 99 collegiate games. 99 collegiate games. So when you have that type of experience coming into your wide receiver or wide receiver room where your most experienced returning wide receiver, as far as snaps at the wide receiver position, is Nick Harbour. Now, of course, Luke Doty has seen more snaps throughout his career, but that includes playing quarterback. I'm talking strictly playing the wide receiver position. Your most experienced returning wide receiver on South Carolina's roster is a sophomore. 
is a sophomore. So it concerns me knowing that you need to find guys to step up, especially knowing that you're going to have a new quarterback back there. And we've talked about this before. Lenora Sellers, I know a lot of Gamecock fans are excited to watch him, and rightfully so. But there's going to be, naturally, growing pains. You don't have Spencer Rattler back there. And it's I'm not even talking from a talent standpoint. I'm talking from an experience standpoint. There's going to be growing pains, naturally, as there is with any young quarterback. So if you don't have a wide receiver room that can create separation, it doesn't matter who the hell's back there, a quarterback, but especially a young one, things could go south quickly. Things could go south quickly. I do feel like when we look at the talent in that wide receiver room, there are guys that can create separation. There are guys that can create explosive plays. But are you going to be able to get that consistently? Who's going to be your go-to guy? I feel like, at least right now, in my mind, and this is a little wishful thinking because we have to wait and see how these transfers look when they're out there in the spring. But to me, that guy is Jared Brown. Talking with his former positional coach over at Coastal Carolina, I know many people in the Midlands are remember Perry Parks from his days coaching at Ridgeview. Talking with Perry, Perry told me he's like, he's someone that can do it all. You can put him in the in the slot, you can put him out of the perimeter. They even featured him in the backfield a little bit, caught some passes out of the backfield. He reminds me a lot, and I hate to make comparisons when you have a player making the jump up, but at least from what he was doing at Coastal Carolina, we'll have to wait and see if he's used this way at at South Carolina, but he reminds me a lot in the sense of versatility of what we saw with Debo Samuel when he was at South Carolina. Obviously, what he's done in the NFL, the 49ers use him, I feel like, just a little bit more in the sense of what South Carolina was trying to do with him right now. Obviously, Debo went through just like he's gone through in the NFL. He's went through a bunch of injuries at South Carolina, and that limited him in the sense of what USC was able to do with him. He was able to return kicks, too, for crying out loud. But I think with Jared Brown, you need a player like that, especially in this wide receiver room, someone that you can truly just plug here, plug there, and that's going to be able to help them do things as far as, okay, if another wide receiver has a strength, because obviously you look at the height in that wide receiver room, the majority of the players, not the tallest, not the tallest, that's all right. But if you have that, some players might not be able to play out on the perimeter as much. Well, you have a guy like Jared Brown. If you feel confident enough, regardless of his height, weight, all that, if you feel confident enough with him, he can become kind of like a utility guy for you, like in baseball. I mean, we talked about that with Nick Gargiulo on the offensive line last year. Because of his versatility, you could play him not just at the center position, but you could play him at guard, you can play him at tackle. That's one of the reasons why Gargiulo, his stock right now, is going up as we approach the NFL draft. That's why he was invited out to the NFL Combine this past week out in Indy. Because he has that versatility. Because he's able to bring multiple things to the table. Now, obviously, we saw what Xavier Leggett did last year. Leggett was able to play inside. He was able to play outside. But Leggett, from a just a physical standpoint, you don't have anyone on the roster like that. You have Nick Harbour. You have Nick Harbour, who obviously, from a speed standpoint, my goodness, we know what kind of freak he can be. Right? But Leggett... Body size, a little bit bigger in terms of muscle mass, all that kind of stuff. Harbor, more of that track figure, right? And that's not to say Harbor can't be a beast. I still think he's slowly growing into it, though. We've mentioned this many times before in the past. The thing with Harbor is he was a five-star athlete. Wasn't a five-star wide receiver coming out of high school. Five-star athlete. Played edge, played tight end. He's still learning the position at wide receiver. Now, he certainly will have to be someone that South Carolina can count on this year playing wide out. Is he going to be ready to be that number one guy? I don't think he's going to be the number one guy yet. And I don't think you need to really 
force that on them, especially if you can get production from one of these veteran transfers that you're bringing in, starting with Jared Brown. But I do feel like what we can get from Harbor, what we can hopefully expect from Harbor, is someone that's going to look a little bit more polished in the sense that, okay, I played the position for one year. I'm starting to get more comfortable, starting to catch more passes, starting to get my confidence up because there were a lot of drop passes in the preseason last year with Arbor. But he was still learning the position. A lot of thinking. There's a lot of thinking. I mean, we talk about it a lot more defensively, but it's the same that, that can be said about offense. You're trying to figure out, okay, what the hell am I supposed to do? College football, obviously the game's a hell of a lot faster. Everything's moving so much quicker. You talk to any former player, I don't care if it's D1, D2, D3. When you make the jump up from high school to college, the game is just faster. And one of the main reasons why is because from a mental standpoint, you're processing more. Once you're able to go out there and you're not thinking as much and you're able to just play, the game starts to slow down for you. So I think with Harbor being able to get some of that experience last year, I think the game will start to slow down for him. Robert Short, good to have you on. He mentions a player that I've been very excited to see in the spring, Tyshawn Russell. I liked what Russell did last year. I liked what we, we saw from him in the limited action that South Carolina used him. I think the thing with Russell is now with the three additions via the transfer portal, where would South Carolina like to put him? Because obviously in a perfect world, these three transfers that are coming in on top of Harbor, they're going to be able to make an impact. They're going to be able to make an impact. Now, before South Carolina added these three players from the portal at wideout, I felt like Russell was one of those guys that could be pushing to make an impact as the number three wide receiver. He's still very like he still very well could, because in a perfect world, you bring in players from the portal, everyone's able to figure things out. Everything's all sunshine and rainbows, right? But that's not always the case. I don't want to pick on the guy, but let's just use an example. Eddie Lewis last year. Eddie comes in, a lot of speed, a lot of production in the past. For whatever reason, he just wasn't able to work out at South Carolina. That happens sometimes with the portal. Some guys you're going to be able to bring in here, and they're going to have incredible seasons. And it doesn't even have to necessarily be at wide receiver. You look at what South Carolina has done since Shane Beamer has arrived. You know, Put Spencer Rattler aside. Think of a guy like Nate Atkins and what Nate was able to do and the production that he was able to bring to the table. There's going to be players that you can bring in here, and they will make an impact. But I wouldn't be banking on the fact of all three guys being able to make that type of impact that we're hoping for. And that's not trying to be a negative Nancy or be a wet blanket in the room. But I think realistically, you have to look at what you do have on this roster. The returning players. Because regardless, if, if these three transfers can make an impact the way that you truly believe they can, whether they can do that or not, South Carolina has talked about it in the past. They want to be able to have six wide receivers that they truly believe in. Six wide receivers. So if those three guys are the guys... Throw in Harbor. That's four. Who are those other two? Who are those other two? In my preseason predictions, if you haven't seen it, I did a breakdown of every room. I think Luke Doty, at least heading into the season, will be in that sixth spot. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that he has a lot of experience here already with the offensive system. Now, granted, it was just one year. But we even heard from Rattler last year some of the things that Doty was able to do because of his knowledge at playing quarterback. The way that he's able to see and read defenses playing wide receiver, he has a major advantage from a mental standpoint because he sees it in a very unique way, in a way that a lot of wide receivers, they're just not going to see it because of his background of playing quarterback. So I, I think when you look at that, whether it's Doty or not, I do think, and we'll get into it a little bit more, I'm going to pull up the roster here for those of you guys to check out. 
I think there's going to be one of those wide receivers from last year's group that were freshmen who's going to have an opportunity to make a big impact this year. Could that be a guy like Codwell? Could that be a guy like Henderson? Someone's going to have to step up this year at that wide receiver's position who maybe wasn't playing that much last year. Who's that guy going to be? Let us know who you think is going to be that wide out. Because again, you have three transfers coming in. That's great. It's awesome. They've been able to produce at, at their old schools. That's awesome. Are they going to be able to do that here? And if God forbid, one of those guys of those three, or maybe even two, maybe even three, that'd really suck. But if one of these guys can't hit the way that you expect them to, it's not going to be the hit. Who's going to have to step up in that wide receiver room? Here's what you got. Jared Brown. Murray Huggins, Bruce, Gage Laverdine. We talked about those three. After that, as far as returners, and we've talked about this before, Luke Doty, from a production standpoint, we talked about Harbor has the most receiving yards, so he's the most most uh, experienced wide receiver as far as snaps go as a returner for South Carolina at wideout, but Doty has the most catches from last year's group who's back this year for South Carolina. 13 passes for 123 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Peyton Mangrum's in there. And I love Peyton, but he's mainly been a special teams contributor. Great story, though. Former walk-on, earned a scholarship a couple years back. Tyson Russell. We were talking about Russell before. Appeared in 10 games as a true freshman in 2023 including the final nine games. Caught five passes for 81 yards and a touchdown. I really like what we saw from Russell last year in just that limited time of action. Six feet tall. See if he put on some weight according to the roster. Let me get the updated roster here. He's at 188 right now. So put some weight on, put some good weight on. In addition to Tyson, Elijah Codwell. Codwell didn't appear in a game last year as a true freshman. So he still has four years of eligibility remaining. He was banged up a little bit, hang it heading into preseason camp. So I felt like at that point, naturally, he was just behind the eight ball a little bit, trying to play catch up. It's tough to be able to do when you're a true freshman, I mean, especially with some of the guys they had in that room. I mean, at that point, Juice was battling an injury, but Juice was still, he was still your guy at that point. Xavier Leggett, of course, he came on and he did a phenomenal job last season for South Carolina. Goes without saying. Uh, Kelton Henderson, as we mentioned, he appeared in two games last year as a true freshman, but did not record a stat, so he still has four years of eligibility remaining. C.J. Adams will be a redshirt freshman as well. He still has four years, didn't appear in a game last year. In addition to those returners, Mazio Bennett, true freshman from Greenville, and DeBron Gatlin, another true freshman. Gatlin, 6'2", 185, a max prep All-American as a freshman and sophomore. Hauled in 84 passes for 963 yards and 11 touchdowns this past year as a senior. Posted over 2,500 receiving yards in his final three years of high school. Going back to Mazio, though, number three overall prospect from the state of South Carolina. He enrolled early, so he's going to have an opportunity to compete. And I've mentioned before with Mazio, it really stands out to me is when you watch his route running, he doesn't look like someone that just came out of high school. He looks like someone that has been in college. There's little things that he does that just stand out to me from you know my days of playing defensive back in college that receivers learn once they get in college. He does some of those little things already. I'm very excited to see what his game's going to look like in a year, two years as he has an opportunity to work with Mike Furry 
And Furry's mentioned it. He was trying to recruit him to Limestone. So this is a guy that Furry loves, is very well aware of, because, again, he was trying to recruit him to go to a Division II school. He's excited to work with him. And I think being able to work with a guy like Furry, being able to fine-tune the little things in your route running is really going to be able to help him take his game to that next level. So read some of the comments that you guys have. Appreciate it. We have a big show right now. Number of people that are watching. Erlin says, what's good, y'all? What's good, Erlin? Travis Edwards says, what's up, GC Live fam? Erlin says, Russell can definitely be a good wide receiver. He has to continue to work on his confidence and hands. Putting some muscle on him is key, too. Yeah. I think being able to see that he's put some weight on, at least according to the roster, and sometimes those rosters can fudge numbers a little bit. Uh, funny story. I need to be able to put some extra weight on one summer. I think it was going into my sophomore year of college. My defensive back coach is, Mike, you got to put some weight on. And I just struggled. I struggled. So it's the summer. I'm showing up for weighing. I have a sweatshirt on and sweatpants. T tells me to take the sweatshirt off. I kept the sweatpants on. What they didn't know is I had ankle weights on. So I weighed an additional 10 pounds. And they're like, man, you put some real muscle on in the offseason. I said, hell yeah. I don't think that's happening at South Carolina. But I say that to say that, yes, sometimes these numbers can be fudged a little bit on the rosters. But we'll have an idea. And I'm sure when we see Tyshawn Russell at practice in the next week and a half, when South Carolina returns to the practice field on March 19th, that we're going to be able to tell, like, man, this guy put some serious muscle on. I mean, I've been seeing some videos of guys who have either enrolled early, like a Dante Reno. Even seeing Reno, Reno looks like he's put some good, some good uh, weight on, some good muscle on. And you can see it more so with a lot of high school players. I mean, you can see it, obviously, from a frame standpoint, but a lot of them put it on really in their legs. Because that's where you can really gain, you know, 10 pounds of muscle quick, being able to get into all the power lifting and just being able to be around a college weightlifting program. And that's no disrespect to some of the high school strength and conditioning coaches out there or trainers who some of these high school players who are new here worked out with. But when you're in a college weightlifting program and not just that, but now you have the nutrition side of it too, and you're able to really understand like, all right, yeah, I can go out there. I can lift. I can run. I can do this and that. If you're not putting the stuff that you need to into, into your body, weightlifting, running, it's only going to do so much. So, yeah, I think with, with Tyson Russell, obviously excited to see what he's able to do from a performance standpoint, but I'm just excited to see what he looks like. I'm excited to see what some of the guys that – you know, are rising sophomores. What have they done in the off season? You know, what do they look like now from a body standpoint? What were they able to do? Were they able to put on some muscle? I know that's something in particular with the offensive line, defensive line that a lot of people bring up and rightfully so. I totally get it that over the last couple of years, fans have wanted to see bigger offensive linemen and bigger defensive linemen for the Gamecocks. Because they feel like, all right, hey, we're in the SEC. You need to be able to stop the run. You need to be able to run the football. Well, how are you going to be able to do that? You need to be able to have big boys to be able to do that, right? Certainly with what South Carolina has done from an investment standpoint with recruiting, whether it be the offensive line, whether it be defensive line, we keep hearing it over and over and over. Trenches, trenches, trenches. You keep seeing the tweets. You keep seeing it on the marquee. RIP, the old cotton gin. But that's one thing in particular South Carolina has really stressed since Beamer has arrived here. And I think we've, we're starting to see it going back to last year's recruiting class with the Louis and Bubalade and Trevon Baugh, but you're also seeing it this year too. You're also seeing what South Carolina is doing from a recruiting standpoint and some of the guys that they were able to bring in on both sides, but especially the offensive line as they look to continue to beef up the trenches. Cam Pringle, being one of those players, 6'7", 335 pounds. Uh, Kamar Bell, transfer, coming on in, 6'2", 310. 
What other size do we have? Blake Franks coming in here, 6'5", 336. And, of course, one of the best offensive linemen for the class of 2024, Josiah Thompson, 6'7", 300. So, yeah, I mean, being able to beef up both sides of the line is going to be big. But going back to what we were talking about with, with the wide receivers, let us know, continue to let us know what you think. Zachary. Barker says, ready for spring ball in the spring game. I feel like Beamer has done his best from a talent and coaching standpoint. Yeah, I mean, look, we've talked about it before. I know some people don't want to hear it. You can only do so much in this era when it comes to being able to get players in here, right? I mean, NILs changed the game a little bit. Certainly, I say changed the game a little bit, a lot. But at the end of the day, you still need to go out there and you need to find ways to win. And what South Carolina has done from a recruiting standpoint and not just recruiting players, what they've been able to do from a coaching staff standpoint. I mean, it's been musical cheers. It's called for what it is between hirings and firings, coaches sliding from this position to that position, coaches leaving for head coaching jobs, coaches leaving after six weeks to go be a positional coach at another school. It's been a lot. Ten changes altogether going back to January 3rd, so just over the last two months. But when you look at who South Carolina has brought in from a coaching standpoint, it should excite you at a lot of those positions. I know obviously Sean Elliott coming back, coaching tight ends and being able to be the run game coordinator has a lot of fans excited, a lot of former players as well. Being able to bring in Mike Furry over the last couple of weeks as he looks to develop that wide receiver room that we're talking about. You got talent there. Just it's a lot of young players though. Young players. The majority of them are young. Zachary again. Doty did a good job at receiver. He was catching the ball. Yeah. I, I think I think some people, they look at Luke Doty and they're like, all right, why is he going to be the receiver? We got to put someone else there. And then you realize some of the things, the little things. You go back and you watch the games last year and you talk to some of the people in that building and it starts to make more sense. And I've even seen this with people who weren't crazy about Doty at wide receiver. What Doty does a good job of, we were talking about it a little bit before, because of his background as a quarterback, especially in a lot of those option routes, he knows exactly where the soft spot is on the defense. And he can get open. And you talk about his, his hands, Zach. Robbie Ashford, during media availability with the transfer players, which was, I'd say, about a month ago now. That was one thing in particular that he brought up. He said, being able to work with Luke Doty, he's like, that guy got hands. He's like, you're a quarterback? You came in as a QB? He's like, that guy has hands. So, look, I think the beauty about Doty is, especially in the situation that South Carolina is in, you know what you're going to get from him as far as, all right, he's going to be a tremendous teammate. He's going to do whatever the hell he needs to do to be able to help the team, help the younger players out. But I also think, too, as that room continues to come along, he's someone that at least you can trust right now because you know he understands what's being asked of him. Now, am I saying that this is a guy that will be the number one wide receiver, the number two for the – no. And without due respect to Luke, I hope that's certainly not the case this year with South Carolina because you want to be able to get production from some of these guys that you're bringing in via the portal on top of Nick Harbour. So – if you're able to do that and Doty's able to give you just a little something, just a little something, man, now you're going to be cooking with something. Now you're going to be cooking. But again, that's just wishful thinking. Erlen mentions Codwell. Travis Edward says, can Doty be an outside wide receiver or is he a slot only? Only, I think that will be key. We mainly just saw him in the slot. I think the reason they love him in the slot is because of his speed and what he's able to do from a, like I mentioned, mentioned in those option routes, he really creates a lot of matchup nightmares, I think, for defensive coordinators in the slot because he he's very shifty. He's very shifty. So you got to decide, all right, am I going to put, am I going to put a safety on him? Am I going to put a nickel on him? Am I going to put an outside linebacker on? And we saw that last year because some teams didn't respect Doty as much. So they would put an outside linebacker on him. And what happened? Well, Doty was able to get open. 
He was able to get open. He was able to create separation. Travis again mentions Mazio looks like he can create separation based on how he paces routes. Yeah. Again, going back to one of the videos we did, I believe it was from the 7-on-7 tournament a year ago when Greenville was here. And maybe in like around June, July of last this last year. And we broke down a route in particular. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. Mazio ran, I believe it was a post corner. And the timing of it was just perfect. Because sometimes when you have high school players come out, they're so programmed. Okay, I'm running a post corner. I have to make my cut at this spot. You know, I got to cut eight yards, 10 yards. I got to do this. You know, I got to make my cut here. The thing with Mazio, and this goes back to what I was talking about, where he's just, he's very advanced in his route running for someone of his age. He understands like, okay, yeah, at some point I have to make a cut by a certain time, right? Or the time is going to be off. But at the same time too, he understands he's trying to get the cornerback to open up his hips. Because as soon as that happens, he's able to make that second cut. And in that in particular video that we were talking about, we broke down, as we call it. I mean, he put the cornerback on skates. Cornerback was just, he was turned around. He had a baseball turn. It was actually good recovery by the corner, all things considered. Always look out for the corners. But Mazio was able to create separation because he just understands when he's running a route, he, he's, very, he's very patient, as you mentioned but he's very intentional with every cut. It's not just, hey, I'm going to go out there, I'm running this route. No, like every cut that he does, he understands why he's doing it to be able to get the cornerback to open up his hips. And obviously being able to play in the SEC, making the jump from high school to going up against some of the best players in the country. And obviously, as we know from the last couple of years of the NFL draft, there's a lot of talent in the SEC when it comes to defensive backs. So he's going to be going up against the best of the best. And I think over time, it's going to be exciting. That's not to say Mazio can't make an impact right away. That's not to say Mazio can't make an impact as as the season plays out. But when I say, okay, this guy already has the tools to go back, and I'm sure some of you guys were told this, maybe from one of your youth football coaches or high school coaches. I remember my coach saying this all the time in high school. You know, You have the tools, but you don't have the toolbox. Mazio has the tools. Mazio already kind of has the toolbox. But now as he makes that jump up to play in the SEC, it's a different ballgame. It's a different ballgame. So over time, once he's able to figure things out, just like any freshman, it's going to be really scary. It's going to be really scary to see what Mazio is able to do. Robert says, in a perfect world, the true, true freshmen get redshirted, maybe appear in three or four games to get experience. That's what I'm hoping for. Now, if you're not able to get the production that you need from some of these wide receivers coming in via the portal, or you feel like you're just not getting enough production from your top six guys, because again, South Carolina has mentioned it in the past. They want to be able to have six wide receivers that they can count on. If you don't feel like you're getting that production from those six and you feel like one of these freshmen can give you that, then certainly, yeah. But in the perfect world, like you said, Robert, you would love not to burn their red shirt year. I know a lot of players, or at least the perception, I think that's a better way to put it. There's a perception that a lot of players just want to get in the field right away. There are, there are, but not every player is like that. Some players understand the big picture of it all which is the development side of it. Now, I've shared this story before, talking with former Gamecocks, Gamecocks who played in a different era. I don't have to go all the way back, though, to like the 80s or 90s. But they talked about when they got to college, they wanted to be able to get into the weight room first and foremost so they can get bigger. But being able to have that extra year, they wanted to be able to say, okay, I have the tools now. But I think the beauty of it, and Robert, you brought it up, I'm glad you did, you have the ability in today's era to still be able to get out to the field, get out there, while also being able to maintain your year of eligibility. So if I am a guy that's towards, I don't want to say the bottom of the depth chart, but if I'm down, okay, around that six mark, right? 
Again, we're talking about the, being able to have six wide receivers. Obviously, the number six guy, if you're in that spot throughout the course of the season, you're probably not going to have as many targets as you would like. So if I'm hovering, okay, six, seven, six, seven, even maybe a five, right? Five through seven. In a perfect world, I'd like to be able to be redshirt if I'm a freshman. I don't know if that will be the case. I don't know if Mazio will be in that spot. I don't know if Gatlin will be in that spot. I mean, if Mazio is able to go out there and he's able to ball out, then yeah, screw it. Forget about the red shirt. Gatlin's able to do that. Screw it. Forget about the red shirt. But you're hoping that's not the case because you're hoping that the guys you're bringing in are able to make an impact. And then you have the perfect scenario where you're able to red shirt these guys so you can get them to be here an extra year. Steve Chandler mentioned, you think Pringle and Thompson will be ready to start by the opening game? No, I don't. And the thing with Thompson, I think because of the experience that they have, you don't necessarily have to throw them into that mix right away. I know that some people, they get caught up. Okay, you know, this guy's a four-star. This guy's a five-star. This guy's ranked here. This guy, I get that. But again, they're freshmen. Now, there's always going to be outliers, as we've talked about many times before in this program where there's going to be freshmen that can come in and they can play right away. Dylan Stork could be one of those players in a very loaded edge room. We'll talk about the edge position another day. But I think when you look at the offensive line with Thompson in particular, I think Pringle will be redshirted. Unless you have injuries, I don't think you need to be able to throw Thompson out there. I really don't if things go the way that you think they can. Now, we've talked a lot about the offensive line. I've given my predictions as far as what I think the week one starters will look like. I'll have to go back and pull it up. Make sure I'm saying the same thing here. Don't want to mention five guys, and I was off on one of them. But again, we did breakdowns for every position, including specialists. So you can head on over to Gamecock Central if you're a subscriber to be able to take a look at all that as well as just the room. You might not necessarily care about the predictions that I'm giving for week one, and I'm sure some of these will change once spring football wraps up and we're able to actually see some of those guys out there. But this is just to give you a sense of the guys that are on scholarship for every position and to give you an idea as to what you can expect from every position. Offensive line. Bear with me for one minute as we try to get this offensive line room up. But the bottom line is South Carolina has a lot of depth on the O-line. They have a lot of experience, which was something that they really struggled with last year. And you think about the injuries that piled up for them, that was one of the main reasons why they were behind the eight ball. So... My week one prediction for starters at left tackle, I have a Luatos and Bubalade. And this actually has been tweaked a little bit because now, you know, with Bell coming in, we'll see where Bell factors in. But this is what I had before Bell got here uh, Luatos and Bubalade at left tackle, Vershawn Lee at left guard, Simpkins, transfer, FCS All American at center, Trevon Barr at right guard. And right now, and there's going to be some great competition, but right now for right tackle, I went with Case and Henry. I mean, injuries plagued Henry from the start of the year to the finish of the year. You know, appeared in just two games in what was a red shirt freshman season. Um, he started week one at right tackle. So it goes to show you what they believe he's capable of doing. Certainly that doesn't guarantee him a starting spot week one. But I do feel like because of that experience and the fact that they they do like him, they like what he's able to do, I think he's someone that will certainly be competing for a starting spot week one. Erlens says, it'll be interesting to see how the cornerback room is going to be turned around. Collier, Floyd, Kari Swain, got to step up and be ready. Well, that's the other position. So we've been talking a lot about wide receiver. Let's move over to defensive back. In particular, as Erlen mentioned, the cornerback room. When I look at the cornerback room, when I look at what South Carolina did this offseason, 
and you look at some of the things that they were able to address as far as the defensive line goes, as far as right defensive tackle, edge, when you look at what they were able to do from a linebacker standpoint in some of the improvements that they were able to have as far as depth goes, safety room in particular, right? You have a lot of talent there. You have a lot of talent there. Um, but when I look at the cornerback room, I think that is one of the biggest questions I have defensively is what are you going to get from that room? You're losing Marcellus Dial. And as we saw from last year, one of the issues with South Carolina was they just didn't have the depth. They didn't have proven depth, as we talk about around these parts on Gamecock Central. They didn't have the proven depth to be able to throw guys in there to be able to help out some of those other cornerbacks as far as snap count goes. And that's why the snap counts, we saw it across the board. Right? We saw it with some linebackers. We saw it with you know, corners, obviously. But snap counts were high. Week one predictions for me for the cornerback room, as long as O'Donnell Fortune doesn't find himself violating any team rules, and that's not a knock against them. I mean, there's a couple games that he was suspended for. Suspended the first half of a game, and then he was suspended for an entire game. But as long as he's able to do what he needs to do, OD Fortune brings the experience factor that we're talking about. After that, where I see things headed for week one, I, I can see Judge Collier being the other starting cornerback. With a year under his belt, got a taste of starting in a couple games last season, he should only get better. He should only get better. Now, not to get completely off topic here, but it plays a role when we're talking about cornerbacks. I think that South Carolina will use Kilgore, Jalen Kilgore, at nickel. When you look at what they have that in that safety room with DQ Smith, Nick Eamon Worry, and then Jalen Kilgore, those are three talented guys, three guys that during their respected freshman seasons, they were all freshman All-Americans. You want to do everything you can to be able to find a way to get all three guys on the field. And I think when you go back to last season, when there was experiments at times, if you want to call it that, with being able to move a guy down like Nick Eamon Worry playing nickel, I think one of the reasons why is because South Carolina wanted to find a way to get all three guys on the field because they were just too damn talented to put one on the bench. And that position is not easy to play. I think nickel is honestly one of the toughest positions to play defensively. Cornerback is a very difficult spot because you're on an island. But in, in that, that nickel spot, you're on an island in a lot of ways, and you're dealing with some of the quickest guys on the team. And the ball is going to come out even quicker because you're closer to the quarterback being in that nickel spot opposed to being out there unless you're on the boundary side. So I bring that up because I think being able to figure out the nickel situation is going to help South Carolina out a lot as far as trying to figure out, okay, this guy can go here. We can play this guy at safety. We can take care of the cornerback situation. After OD Fortune and after Collier, I know you mentioned Vakari Swain. Swain appeared in three games as a true freshman. Two tackles. He has four years of eligibility remaining. In addition to those guys, let's also not forget Emery Floyd. Floyd appeared in three games this past season for South Carolina, finished with two tackles. Member of the track and field team, so you know he's got some speed. He has three years of eligibility remaining. Another player, too, I mean, we could talk about David Spalding as well. I mean, poor guy's been dealing with so many injuries the last two years. Appeared in uh, three games last season. Finished with five tackles, recorded an interception. Also uh, defended a pass. He returns for his sixth and final year of college football. Jalewis Solomon, very talented four-star athlete for the class of 2024. Solomon finished with 17 interceptions during his high school career. Now, again, we've mentioned this. We've mentioned this with some other players, some other freshmen. In a perfect world, you're not going to have to worry about playing these freshmen. But 
at a position like that, I mean, man, if you feel like you trust a freshman, whether it be Solomon, right? Don't forget Zabari uh, Sandy in there as well. Sandy appeared in two games last season as a true freshman. But you have guys, Keenan Nelson Jr., another one, redshirt freshman, blocked the punt, scored a touchdown last year, played a couple games in nickel, started two games at nickel. I think what South Carolina needs to be able to figure out is, okay, hey, if we feel like Collier's our guy, if we feel like OD's our guy, and I keep throwing out Collier because I think that's that's who South Carolina will start, the other cornerback spot across from OD Fortune. If you feel confident there, if you're able just to continue, continue to be able to get these players behind them, the younger players behind them, you're going to really be able to create some of that depth that you're desperately, desperately, desperately trying to create. Something that South Carolina really struggled with last year. They weren't able to have that type of depth. Let's see what you guys have to say, though. Try to get caught up as we have a bunch of people watching right now. I mean, this is like a post-game show, a number of people are watching right now. Appreciate all of you, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, X, whatever the hell you want to call it. Everyone's watching all over the place. Craig, what's going on? Gamecock Ryan says, good afternoon, all. Travis Edwards, Steve Thompson, yes. Pringle, no. Craig Godwin says, Thompson was 265 at the Under Armour game. Did he gain 35 pounds? When I saw him early February... I mean, I don't want to say he's a string bean, but he's because he's just so damn tall. He's so damn tall that you don't realize how much weight he carries. I mean, he's like a basketball player for crying out loud. I wouldn't be shocked that he's put some weight on. Now, again, as we alluded to before, when you look at some of these heights and weights on rosters, and it's not just limited to South Carolina, sometimes the numbers can be fudged a little bit, but I don't think they would have fudged it by 35 pounds. I don't think they would just make it up um, to a point where it's just so extreme. So could it be that he's at 300 or just under 300? Is that what it was? I think it was. It said, double check again. Yep, six, seven, 300 pounds, according to South Carolina's athletic page. I think it's around that. I think it's probably just a little bit under that. But again, it's so tough to tell with him because he's so damn tall. He's like a basketball player. When you see him without pads on, that's what he looks like. He's like a basketball player. Chris Shuttleworth says, who's looking like the starter at running back? And I rock it is slotted, but heard a lot of good things about the kid from South Carolina State. It's going to be good competition. And depending on how much we see from Rocket or even a guy like Juju in the spring, guys like Oscar Attaway, from North Texas, on top of the fact that he mentioned Juan Howell from South Carolina State, they're going to have a real good opportunity to make a strong case early as to why they should be seeing touches this year. Now, the beauty with Howell, because I think Howell's going to be an absolute stud here, the beauty with Howell is he has three years of eligibility remaining. So, and I was having this conversation with someone at the basketball game last night. If if there's any growing pains with him, we saw that with Mario Anderson last year, early on, right? Makes the jump up from D2. There were some things that he was just picking up a little bit slower in terms of pass pro. If there are growing pains, the beauty is you don't have to get so caught up in the fact that, man, we're not playing him as much right away. As long as he understands the situation, why you're doing it, you have to explain it to him. And I think you would explain that to any player. I think Markwell Blackwell is going to be able to do that just fine. But if you're able to explain that to a player, hey, you know what? We need you to do this. This is what you're doing. We feel like you need to be able to do this a little bit better. If that is the case, he's able to come along. He's able to get his confidence up because the worst thing that you can have happen is you throw someone in there. They're not ready to go in the way that you need them to. And their confidence is just shot. And you're not able to get them to mentally come back. So I think more than anything, if you're able to get Howell in here and Howell's able to do some good things, maybe he is ready to go fairly early. Maybe he's not. But you're able to help him along knowing that, hey, we have three years with this guy. Three more if he chooses to do so. He's talked about his goals to play in the NFL. 
He wants to play in the SEC. Did a story on him beginning of the week. And I think one thing in particular that really stood out that he that he said stood out to me was I knew, and I'm paraphrasing, I knew what I was getting myself into with the amount of talent in that running back room, especially all the players that South Carolina acquired via the portal. Never mind the fact that they're bringing in one of the best running backs for the class of 2024, top 15 running back by on three, and Matthew Fuller, who at the moment, he's not on campus. Fuller is going to be enrolling in the fall. So what does that do for those running backs that are already here? Right? Howell mentioned he's not afraid of the competition. Another guy that's in that room that I don't want to overlook is DJ Braswell. Really liked what Braswell did last year. Because of some of the injuries towards the end of the year, he was forced to burn his red shirt. But that's a guy that did a lot of good things from a pass pro standpoint. We've talked about it before in this program. What's one way to be able to earn the, the, the trust of your coaching staff? That's being able to go out there and be able to demonstrate that you can go out there and have some consistency from a, pra- a pass pro standpoint. You know, obviously, if you could run the football, if you can catch out of the backfield, that's great. If you could be a three down back, that's great. But when we're talking about being a three down back, you need to be able to protect the quarterback, pass pro, especially in a situation where you don't know what South Carolina's wide receivers are going to give them this year. I mean, we've mentioned that before that they need to be able, they need to be able to go out there and they need to be able to create separation because you're going to have a new quarterback back there. Continuing to move along, though. I think, you know, bottom line is it, it's going to be open competition, Chris. That's my way of saying it's going to be open competition. I think Rocket's going to be an absolute stud, but I wouldn't write off Attaway. I wouldn't write off Howell. Um, I wouldn't write off Braswell. And again, we'll see with Juju and Rocket where they're at, both with their injuries. Arthur L. Smith says Luke Doty might be South Carolina's Hunter Renfro. To some limited extent. No, it's one way to look at it, RL. Travis Edwards says, I think our wide receiver room is being disrespected early into the season until they start showing out. Not having a clear number one can be beneficial to this offense, similar to the 2013 team. I hear what you're saying, Travis, but I also feel with this team, you need one guy in that room to really be able to step up because the difference with that year in 2013, and obviously I wasn't here to cover that year. But I, I'm sure you would all agree, as we have another 100 people hop on to watch. Appreciate this. Matt, monster show. You guys are just ready to talk some football, huh? The difference, though, with that 2013 team was you just had studs. You had some studs. You also had a really damn good quarterback, too, 2013, right? With Connor Shaw. But you had a lot of studs across the board. So is it possible that South Carolina doesn't need a true number one? Of course, of course. But at the same time too, when you look at that 2013 team, it's, it's tough for me to say, Oh yeah, replicate it just after 2013. You had some talented guys there. You had some talented guys here. Might keep this show rolling just because of the number of people watching right now. Um, Again, this is a, um, this is like a, Post game show, the number of people watching right now on a Thursday. So I appreciate everyone that tuned in today, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, X, whatever the hell you want to call it, everything. Appreciate everyone that is here. A lot of comments that you guys have sent in. I'm going to do my best to be able to go through those. If you have any comments, the big thing that we've talked about today, what is your biggest concern with this football team heading into the spring ball? Because I think it's too early to say the fall. Okay. What are you worried about? What do you want to see this spring that's going to make you feel better about this team? We've talked a lot about the wide receivers. We've talked about uh, the cornerback situation. Those two positions in particular are what really stand out to me. Now, there's other things that we could talk about. Alex Herrera going to be looking to be the starting place kicker after Mitch Jeter made the move over to Notre Dame this offseason. That might be it. You know, Let us know. Quarterback situation. You don't have Spencer Rattler here anymore. You could still be very excited about Lenora Sellers or any of the other quarterbacks in that room, but you might feel at the same time, man, going to be making a change from a very experienced quarterback 
to now a quarterback that doesn't have as much experience. That could be it. Let us know. Fire away. Phil. Phil says if we are needing to depend on freshman offensive line, we are going to have some serious issues on offense. Yeah, there's always going to be outliers, right? You can have a freshman offensive lineman. Certainly South Carolina's situation last year, that was one of those situations that in the moment, you're trying to look at the glass half full. Now, six, seven, eight months later, we can sit back and be like, all right, yeah, you know, there were some good things because of that. Was it great at the time? No. Would you have loved to be able to protect Spencer Rattler a little bit more? No question. Absolutely. But, yeah, I mean, you have talented guys, whether they're four stars, whether they're five stars, it's okay to not play these guys right away. Now, I know some people get worried in the era that we're talking about now with college football, transfer portal, all that. That's your job, though, as a coach, though, too. That's like we're talking about recruiting. We're not just talking about recruiting high school players. We're not just talking about recruiting via the transfer portal. We're also talking about recruiting and being able to keep your room together year after year. I know some people don't want to hear that. I know some people might not agree with that. They might say, man, I don't like this new era of college football. And I totally understand with you. But the reality is, this is the era that we're living in. This is the era that we're living in. So if you have concerns about that, if you have concerns about a player leaving, and Phil, I'm not saying that this is how you feel, but I think it's it, it, it's a good time just to remind some folks. If you have players leaving because they're not playing as much as they want, that was the case with some players last year that decided to leave. Let's just call for what it is. Some players said they want to be closer to home. <laughs> A little bit more to some of those stories. We've talked about that in the past with Gamecock Central. But if some people don't want to trust that process, then so be it. So be it. You're not going to be able to please everybody. Because as soon as you worry about that and you're just trying to throw freshmen out there to be happy, you're not going to be able to compete with a freshman team in the SEC. It's just not going to happen. Travis says, oh, he talks about the offensive line. Again, I don't fully agree with the offensive line take as far as you know putting some of those freshmen out there thompson and that's not to say thompson can't play it's just saying that hey south carolina's done a good job with being able to bring in some talented guys and they have a lot more experience this year in comparison to where they were a year ago that's for damn sure hoping Doty has a great season as wide receiver as uh let's see as a reward for working his ass off and being very unselfish exo make Says that Craig Goodwin, Carolina Rise and Garnet Trust joining together. That is correct. Got word of that. I want to say last week. So if you're saying that, Craig, I'm assuming the announcement has been out there. Uh, if it isn't yet, then, well, I'll get yelled at, but that's all right. I think the announcement actually came out a little while ago. Yep, that is correct. Uh, though actually came out at 155. So, Craig, you are correct. To basically sum it up, Garnet Trust, Carolina Rise, there's just one collective now. And I think it's tremendous that Carolina Rise and Garnet Trust was able to do that because it just makes things easier. I mean, when you have multiple collectives, it's just going to confuse people. So it's awesome to see that they both came together because at the end of the day, both have been just trying to raise money for student athletes for South Carolina. So they were able to make it happen. Glad you brought that up, Craig. Travis Edwards says, we've never signed an offensive lineman prospect is rated as high as Thompson. We can't view him the same as we do other freshman offensive linemen. I don't fully agree with that, Travis. And here's why. There's going to be players, again, not the exact same situation. There's going to be players like a Nick Harbour that come in here but that doesn't necessarily mean, hey, you know, this guy's ready to go. I know I work for a, a, a recruiting website, and I think there's a lot of great things that you can get from these recruiting websites. But I'm also a true believer that once you get to college, the stars mean nothing. They mean nothing. I know fans, they like to talk about it. We talk about it here in the offseason. It's fun to talk about but if you talk with any of these college coaches, they could care less about these numbers. They could care less about how many stars a player has. From a recruiting standpoint, when you're trying to sell a program, we see it a lot on National Signing Day, two National Signing Days now, now that South Carolina talked at all on that second one because they didn't sign anyone. But that first one, 
a lot of these coaches talk about, okay, hey, you know, yeah, it's great. You know, we have this class, it's the highest or you know, this many play. They'll do it then. But once the players get to the field, they don't care. They don't care how many stars they have. Let's see. What else we got here? Robert Short. What do you think the edge room is going to look like? I think the thing with the edge room is another hundred people hopped on. Holy cow. Appreciate you guys. This is almost bigger than a post game show. I think the thing with the edge room is you have, again, a lot of experience, a lot of talent in that room. And I mentioned this last week when we we're talking about the edge room. Naturally, Dylan Stewart's going to get talked about. I totally understand that, right? But when you look at that room, when you look at who's coming back, there's one player in particular that I feel like is getting overlooked. Now, when I did our breakdown on the edge room, and I'm trying to pull this up right now so that I can be able to, we're hitting every position. You guys want to talk about different positions? That's fine with me. We'll bring it up. So that's why I'm trying to grab this so I can answer your questions. You have Elijah Davis, Trell Dawkins, Kyle Kennard, Kennard, uh, Brian Thomas Jr. You have Gear, Desmond Umi Ozulu, and then Dylan Stewart. To me, and this is what I wrote in my week one prediction, to me, what really stands out is what Brian Thomas Jr. was able to do. And he even goes back to last spring, if you guys remember the spring game. But Thomas had, let's see, started in six games, six of the 12 games he appeared in this past season, racked up 22 tackles, was also credited with two tackles for a loss, one sack, and one forced fumble. He has two years of eligibility remaining. To me, he's the guy. He's the guy heading into the season. Now, Goddard is one of those guys that has the experience and has proven it at a Power 5 school. It was at Georgia Tech. He had 54 tackles, 11 tackles for a loss, six sacks, two forced fumbles. An interception, blah, 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 blah. Did a lot. He's another guy that I think is going to be competing for that starting spot when you think of the two guys up there. After that, there's just a lot of talent. Terrell Dawkins goes through the knee injury in 2022. Only appeared in five games this past season. Didn't record any stats. Does he get over that mental hurdle that we talk about a lot with players going through, especially lower body injuries? Is he able to overcome that? Heading into this season now, you overcome that mental hurdle that first year after the injury, and then you're able to go out there and just play. I think he's going to be able to do that. But the player that I feel like is just not getting talked about, I know I mentioned him, but he's not getting talked about a lot. He's kind of get he's kind of like the the, the middle child, it feels like, in, in a sense. Because like I said, you have Dylan Store coming in, consensus five-star, number 12 overall prospect for the class of 2024. Stud. We know that, right? Talked about Brian Thomas. Talked about some of these other players. Gennard, right? Desmond Umio Zulu is a player that I just feel like he's not getting talked about nearly enough this offseason. He appeared in all 12 games last year as a true freshman. Finished with nine tackles. Has three years of eligibility left. But he is someone that we've heard a lot about. Sterling and Lucas have been raving about this young man since he arrived on campus, talking about his motor, talking about his work ethic, talking about the things that he brings to the table as an athlete because, you know, he has long friggin' arms. He's able to do things at that edge position that makes him very unique because of just the, the freakish size that he has. You look at Desmond Umi Ozulu talking about updated rosters. We head on over to Gamecock, the Gamecock's athletic page, 6'6, 244. That wingspan, though, I'd be interested to know what his wingspan is. He is just a massive, massive human being. That's the player who I think is not getting talked about nearly enough, and I think he's going to have an incredible season this year. I really do. I think Travis brings him up. Edge is similar to DBs with the scheme. Can determine who plays. 4-2-5 edge. Kennard, Edmund, Dez. Yeah, I mean, you have you have the players in that room. Brian Deal, and some of these comments were made about 
15, 20 minutes ago. So apologize just getting to some of them now, trying to go through all of them as we have more people making their way in. Brian Deal says, and we can't let Nick get caught in coverage versus wide receivers like he did against Florida. Yeah, I don't think you'll see that situation. I mean, things happen, but as far as that unique situation by putting them down there. And the other thing, too, we've talked about this before in the past, and it's not to say at the end of the day, obviously, you got to do your job, right? Do your job. But South Carolina shouldn't have been in that, that situation. You had DQ Smith coming off the edge and DQ lost contain. And I love DQ. And we've talked about this before. It's not trying to pile on the kid, the product of Spring Valley. But and I'm sure he'd be the first one to tell you this because he lost containment on the quarterback on that blitz. It screwed up everything. You cannot let the quarterback get to the outside on that play. Fourth down, you got to keep the quarterback in the pocket. You might not get there on the sack, but allowing him to get to the outside, that's what changed everything. That's what changed everything. Robert says, is Rocket going to be limited in the spring game due to his shoulder? I would expect he would be, Robert. We haven't got any updates yet as far as what the plan is with him, but I would expect that. I mean, we saw back in what? Towards the end of January, he was in a sling a month ago, out of the sling, just continuing to rehab like crazy right now. So, uh, and I would say the same with Juju, too. Erlin says, you already know I'm excited about Howell, the former Bulldog. Can't wait to see him contribute. Talk to a couple South Carolina State coaches. And I think I've shared this before in the past, but for those of you who may have missed it, I asked one coach in particular, I said, what would you tell me is the best way to describe Howell's game? Like if you had to tell me, all right, he reminds me of this player. And the player instantly he said, Najee Harris. He's like, what Najee Harris does? He's like, that's what that's what I would describe Howell's game. And when I was interviewing Howell about a month ago, that was one of the players that he brought up. He's like, I my game is very similar to his. But he's like, at the same time, too, he's like, I don't need to run over everybody. He's like, I got some speed. I got some moves. But I'm the type of player that can run through you and I can run around you. I mean, that's that's music. That's music to Gamecock fans' ears to be able to have a player like that. Now, like we've talked about before with a lot of these transfers, especially players making the jump up, whether it be D2, whether it be FCS, whether it be coming from a Group 5 school. Let's see if they can do it here. And I think Howell will be able to do that. We mentioned this before, the beauty with him. He has three years of eligibility left. You don't have to necessarily get him onto the field right away. You'd love to be able to see him make an impact quickly because that's a guy I feel like that can make an impact here. But at the same time, too, you have a lot of talent in that running back room. And I'm interested to see how that competition pans out. But yes, Erlen, that is one guy in particular I'm very excited to see. Erlen mentions defensively. Willis, I see him getting more time at linebacker, especially in the 3-3-5. I'm not saying that South Carolina won't be running a three-down look, but I think the difference this year in comparison to a year ago is South Carolina, they have more bodies that they can rotate in, especially at the defensive tackle position. So being able to have that, I think will allow them to be able to have fresher legs. We talked about this last year. One thing I really felt that hurt South Carolina is that they weren't able to get to the quarterback really that much. I mean, you go back, especially the beginning of the year, outside of maybe the Furman game, you had Mississippi State in there, of course, but they really struggled to put pressure on the quarterback. And it wasn't just creating sacks. It was creating tackles for a loss as well. And when you're not able to put pressure on the quarterback, what happens? Well, it puts strain on your defensive backs. As I've said many times before, I don't care who the hell you have in the secondary. You could have Stephon Gilmore. You could have Captain Munerlin. You could have DJ Swearinger. You could have J.C. Horn, Israel McQuam, whoever the hell you want in the secondary. Your Gamecock dream second, it doesn't freaking matter. If you're not putting pressure on the quarterback, at some point, they're going to be able to get open. At some point, it's just going to happen. So not being able to consistently put the pressure on 
opposing team's quarterbacks last year really put South Carolina in a tough spot, especially with their secondary play. I expect that to change this year because of those fresh legs. Will they run a three-down look? Yeah, they possibly could. I don't think they're going to get rid of it completely. We know how much Shane liked it. That was an idea that Shane passed along that he wanted to see. And it made a difference. We looked at what South Carolina's defense was able to do towards the end of the year. So I'm not ruling it out altogether. I just feel like they have the bodies now. They have the talent. They have the experience at some of those positions now up front of the line where they can run the four-man look a little bit more. Obviously, if they're not able to get to the quarterback or they don't feel like the production is where it needs to be, then certainly, yeah, of course. Of course they can get creative and, and get away from it, but we'll wait and see. William Dean says, can't wait for the spring ball game. Yes, spring ball. Spring game is going to be April 20th. Practices, as I mentioned, start up, though, on March 19th. And another thing, too, we're going to talk about in a little bit as we have a just a longer show. I mean, I was going to say a bonus edition, but just having a longer show just because there's a bunch of you tuned in today. I mean, to give you an idea of how many more people are watching, I mean, shoot, the numbers are. I mean, the numbers are close to what we do for a post-game show. I mean, this might be bigger than some of the games we did this year. So I don't know if people just want to talk about football. Certainly not tuning in to listen to the Yankee with the Boston accent. Uh, but if you do appreciate our analysis, I appreciate you guys tuning in. Travis says, I truly believe this team has the depth to run both defenses with different personnel. I agree with you. I agree with you, Travis. Lance mentions, Lance Player says, Big Day and NIL. Yes, talking about Garnet Truss and Carolina Rise coming together. So now there's just one collective for South Carolina, in case some of you missed that earlier. R.L. Smith says, I'm watching from my office, so technically I'm making money watching your live show. Well, that's always good. That's always good. Appreciate it. DJ says, do you think Sellers is the guy? I think when you look at South Carolina's quarterback room right now, yes, he is the guy. The question now is, will he be able to not only do the things that you need him to do, like the little things? I think like we talk about sellers, we think about his ability to make plays with his feet, cannon for an arm. We saw that, of course, multiple times when he got into games this past season, certainly that Furman uh, game in particular, just that friggin' bomb. 60 yards in the air. I think it was a 50 yard touchdown, but it was like 60 yards in the air. The thing that I have questions about is will he be able to do the short game stuff the way that South Carolina needs him to? And it's not only going to be just on sellers, as we were talking about before. Some of it is going to fall back on the wide receivers. Are they going to be able to create separation for him? I think back to. Think back to 2020 and what South Carolina really struggled to do that season. You had Shy Smith, but when Shy was covered, South Carolina had nothing else to, like they had no one else to throw the football to. With all due respect to the receivers and tight ends on that team. Of course, guys like Nick Muse was on that team and Nick's playing in the NFL. Just signed a new deal with the Vikings. Congratulations to Nick. I spoke with Nick actually earlier today. He's down in Fort Lauderdale. A lot of those players head down that way this time of the year. Do a lot of training and relax a little bit too. But there's a lot of good facilities down there for NFL players. But I think with Sellers, again, if he's able to just hit those short passes, do things that we just haven't been able to see him do. Now, obviously, the coaches, they get to see it every day. So they know what this guy's capable of doing. But I think to me... That's one thing I'd like to see. I'd like to see, because I know South Carolina, and I know some, some fans get sick and tired of it, but especially when you look at what they have coming back this year or the guys that they've been able to acquire via the transfer portal, there's a lot of speed. Smaller guys, shiftier guys, you need to be able to take advantage of that speed. And I think what South Carolina will do is they'll take advantage of it by doing some short passes, swing passes, screens. They'll take shots down the field. I mean, Sellers has proven that he can throw it down the freaking field. But being able to do that will help them. It will help them out a lot, especially 
if they have questions about this wide receiver room, which we were talking about at the beginning of the show. So that's how I'd answer that. I am interested to see what Robbie Ashford can do because you need competition. You need competition in that room. And if Sellers is the guy, who's going to be the number two guy? I mean, is this a situation that you feel good enough about Ashford? Uh, Bevel obviously is the walk-on coming in from Oklahoma. Dante Reno, been hearing nothing but good things from people inside that building about how Reno has looked. And also, we, my colleague Chris Clark just did an interview with Reno. If anyone wants to see that, guard at Trust interview, head on over to Gamecock Central. And Reno kind of gave some insight as to what's been going on this offseason since he's arrived in South Carolina. But I think there's going to be some good competition there. And that's what you need. Sellers is the guy that's great, but you need to be able to get him to not feel comfortable. We've talked about that many times before. The last thing you want for a young quarterback is to feel comfortable. And what I mean by that is to go into a situation assuming you're going to be the guy. That's why you have to continue to be pushed and you have to continue to have guys next to you that are going to challenge you every day. And I think that will be the case. I think that will be the case. I think Reno is going to bring more to the table than I think some people anticipate. I think a lot of people, okay, hey, that's the guy that was a phenomenal recruiter for us. Reno's going to be able to bring some things to the table that I think is going to really help this program. I mean, I think some people, how quickly some forget. I mean, he was part of the Elite 11, some of the best quarterbacks in the country, getting invited to that camp. So I think the big question with Reno is, He's only a freshman. How much are you going to get out of him right away? Is he going to be able to create that competition? That's why being able to bring a guy like Robbie Ashford and a guy that is hungry to prove to people what he's capable of doing. Robbie mentioned it a month ago. One of the biggest things that he's faced throughout his college career, adversity-wise, is that he hasn't had you know, the same quarterback coach, offensive coordinator, because of all the changes that have happened throughout his college career. Over at Auburn, things just continuing to change. I mean, it's part of college football. But that's one thing in particular that has him excited to be able to play at South Carolina. R.L. Smith says, only thing I am looking for are measurements that come out of the spring game and the spring depth chart. I know these things are guaranteed to change, but it is nice to have a reference point. Yes, we'll have that then. I'm interested to see, too, how far off maybe some of these numbers are. I think it'll kind of be in the ballpark. We'll see. Michael Lynn. Are Pringle and Thompson developed enough to play year one? I think with Thompson, again, we mentioned this before. If Thompson had to go out there, I think he'd be able to figure things out. I think he would be. Now, would he have growing pain? Certainly, especially if he's playing at left tackle. I mean, it's a little bit different when you're playing in, you know, in the interior, right? Because if something happens, you're able to cover it up just a little bit easier. If you're a left tackle and you get beat, I mean, your quarterback could get killed, you know, that that blind side spot. So I think, again, we were talking about it. It's okay for freshmen to come along a little bit slower. It's okay. There's going to be outliers, certainly, right? There's going to be some freshmen that will come in right away. But I think with the offensive line in particular, in a perfect world, you don't want to touch your freshman freshman year. I mean, their their first year. You want to be able to preserve their red shirt. Certainly with what South Carolina had to deal with last year, going back to their left tackle getting hurt in the freaking spring game. You lose Henry. You're starting right tackle. The beginning of the game, week one against North Carolina. And from there, it was just musical cheers. It was just trying to figure out what the heck they needed to be able to do just to survive. That's why what we saw week one, what was it? Nine sacks they gave up? Something crazy like that, eight, nine sacks against North Carolina, nearly double-digit sacks. And after that, you're trying to figure out, okay, what do we have to do to be able to make this thing work moving forward? As time went on, and give a lot of credit to guys like Aluatos and Bubalade and Trevon Ba, they had to go up against some of the best teams in the country. As a true freshman, that's not easy. It's not easy by any means. Going up against Georgia and what some of the things that they did and holding their own in a lot of those those games. So in a perfect world, South Carolina won't have to touch any of them. Greg, appreciate it. Yeah, King Willie, you I, I don't know if this was answered earlier for you. 
I know I'm about 20 minutes behind trying to answer some of these questions, but right now, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, right now I would say I have O'Donnell Fortune and Judge Collier as my week one starters at corner. Greg mentioned Edwards is going to show out, chip on his shoulders. Michael Lynn, it's just spring and I can't wait till football already. I miss it. I miss it too. I miss it too. 100 and I think I posted it actually last night when I drove by williams Bryce Stadium. 177 days until kickoff. Two buys this week, or this year, excuse me, not this week. Two buys this year. Season's going to start a little bit earlier, April 31st. Erlins mentions he's a beast. I think you're talking about Edwards. Erlins says, I'm definitely ready for football season two, but needs to hurry up and get here already. King Willie says, can Clayton White put it all together? I think he'll be able to, King Willie. And I mentioned this before. I think some of it, and I know people don't like hearing some of this because they, they feel like it's an excuse. And if you feel like it's an excuse, that's all right. You're entitled to your own opinion. It's the beauty of this show, right? We say something, you guys, you guys say something, you can agree, you can disagree. That's all right. I think one of the challenges South Carolina had defensively last year, we saw it on offense through the offensive line, but defensively, we knew heading into the year they were going to be very, very young at multiple positions. They were going to be very inexperienced. And when you had the number of injuries pile up, it put them in a position where they really just weren't able to overcome it. Because again, as we've been talking about with some of these freshmen, yeah, you have outliers. You'll have freshmen like, like the Kilgores of the world that can come in and they can make a difference right away. But then there's going to be some freshmen or transfers even, a guy like Mario Anderson. There's going to be some guys that it's going to take them a little bit longer. And that's okay. Okay. Now, Spencer Rattler, he redshirted Oklahoma. I think of the number of guys that redshirted, I think Shane Beamer did an exercise last year during a press conference, and he shared the number of players that redshirted who are going to be week one starters last year. So I say that to say, when you look at that team, injuries certainly caught up to them early on. They didn't have the bodies to be able to be at a level that they needed to be able to. We talked about it before, right? Not being able to put pressure on the quarterback. You don't have the fresh bodies to be able to constantly rotate in there, whether it be D-tackle, whether it be edge, even playing linebacker. And by not putting the pressure on that South Carolina needed to be able to do, especially late in games, you saw how just exhausted they were. They looked exhausted in many of those games. They changed things up towards the end of the season to be able to create opportunities where they could be a little bit fresher, have those fresher legs at the end of games. And we saw what South Carolina was able to do. They had a phenomenal stretch. Came up short against Clemson, but that wasn't because of the defense. Defense gave them a chance to be able to stay in that game. Offense just couldn't score. Couldn't score that game. Michael Lynn again says, our secondary is looking strong. Would you agree, Mike? Vakari Swain? Could break out also. I'd love to see Vakari Swain break out. We mentioned this before. They need to. They need to. They need to. They need to. They need to be able to create opportunities for some of these other guys to create depth at corner. Because when you look at what South Carolina has at the cornerback position, they don't have – that's the position I mentioned before. They don't have as much proven experience. You know, you look at edge, you look at safety, you look at defensive tackle, you look at linebacker, for crying out loud. They have a lot of experience at multiple positions. Unfortunately, cornerback's not one of them. OD Fortune, yeah, he has plenty of it. And knock on wood, and we mentioned this before, it's not a shot at him, it's just calling it for what it is. He was suspended, what, a game and a half last year. Two different suspensions. As long as he can stay out of trouble, do what he needs to do, then you have an experienced corner right there. And then from that, from that, you have a lot of talented guys in that cornerback room. Judge Collier, because of some of the circumstances last year, talking about some of the suspensions, right, with OD, he was able to take advantage of that. And he was able to gain a little bit more experience. So I think with a guy like OD Fortune, 
Collier, those are your two guys. It starts with them. After that, you need to be able to create depth, and Vakari Swain could certainly be one of those players. Certainly be one of those players. Let's see. What else we got here? I think we might wrap up in a little bit, but we still have a crap ton of people that are tuned in right now. I don't know if you guys are at work and you're kind of like, you know what, screw it, I'm already here for the weekend. I don't know what it is, but I appreciate everyone tuning in today. Enjoying the hell out of it. I always enjoy talking football. Obviously, there's been a lot of a lot of things to talk about in Columbia. I know basketball came up short last night. Baseball is going on. Women's basketball, another undefeated regular season. SEC tournament now. And then the men's tournament coming up next week. We'll be in Nashville, Gamecock Central. I'll be heading out there. So if you're heading over to Nashville, Maybe you'll see me. Maybe you'll see me out I'm trying to figure out something. Patrick Davis, I talked to him today. He has a bar right outside of Broadway. It's called Never Never. He won't be there, but maybe, maybe we can turn that bar into Gamecock headquarters. So if Gamecock fans all kind of want to come together, the best way I would describe it for those of you who have been out, on Main Street here in Columbia, it's kind of like a combination, I would say, of bourbon with the look inside and then outside. It's kind of got a, a steel hands outside kind of feel to it. So if you're looking for a place, check out Patrick Davis' spot in Nashville if you're heading out for the SEC tournament next week. What else we got here? Travis mentions Dez, meaning Desmond Umio Zulu had nine or ten quarterback pressures in his limited time last year. I enjoyed him. I really enjoyed watching Desmond and even seeing him in practice a little bit. I mean, that guy, like I said, his friggin' length. He's really able to throw guys off him and not allow them to engage with him because of the reach that he has. King Willie says, I want an LSU win so bad. Beat the Tigers, huh? Going to be a tough schedule this year. I mean, it's always tough, right, SEC? But, man, it's going to be a tough one. It will be a tough one. Erlins has a faster version than Najee Harris. Going back to our conversation about Juwan Howell. I didn't get a chance to really see him this year. I mean, I covered South Carolina State for six years during my time at Watch Fox. So obviously he wasn't there. But, I mean, people that have paid attention to South Carolina State, they know a lot of talent that comes out of the SWAC and the MEAC, in this case, the MEAC here with South Carolina State. I'm interested to see what he's going to be able to do. Very interested to see what he's going to be able to do. Erlen says, ready to see the Gamecocks and Steelers. Ah, oh, Erlen, you're losing me there with the Steelers. Granted, the Patriots stink now, so I got nothing to really talk about. Let's see. Gilbert Edmond will have a chip on his shoulder. That's another player, Greg. I mean, I'm interested to see what Gilbert Edmond can do because if you're able to get really anything out of him, and I'm sure they will, but if you're able to just get anything out of him, it's just the cherry on top because not just from a production standpoint, which obviously would be great if you're able to get production from this guy, what he's going to be able to do from a locker room standpoint, what he's going to be able to do from an experience standpoint and be able to talk to other players about his experience of leaving. I mean, to me, first and foremost, that is extremely valuable for the program. And I'm not saying that that's the main reason, or that's the only reason why Shane Beamer brought him back. I mean, Beamer brought him back because he feels like he can make an impact on the team. I mean, he wouldn't bring him back just to be a Guinea pig as far as that's concerned. But if he's able to give you anything in that room, which we talked about, I mean, that's a talented edge room, very talented edge room. I don't know how many snaps he'll see. I don't know how often he'll be used. But when you look at the talent in that room, in particular, the 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 new guys coming in and with, with Dylan Stewart, and then you have guys that are rising sophomores like Desmond Umi Ozulu, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of competition in that room. Erlen mentions chill <laughs> with the Steelers. If you guys have any final questions, let us know. We're getting closer. I want to get five more viewers here so we can hit another big number. 
uh, with the viewership today. Do you want to say this too? If anyone has any question, let us know. One thing about Pro Day next week with the 15 players that are going to be taking play part, one player in particular I'm really excited to watch is going to be Jordan Strawn. And this is, you know, not including the five players that took part in the NFL Combine last week in Indy. Jordan Strawn's a guy that three years ago led the country in sacks when he was at Georgia State. Went through a lot, obviously, last year or two years ago, excuse me, with the ACL injury week two against Arkansas. Bounced back, did some good things last year. We talk about the mental hurdles when you come back from a lower body injury. He was able to overcome that. I think two challenges that Strawn will face as to why his, his stock will drop a little bit this year is, number one, his age. He's 25 years old. But the other part of it is his injury history, right? So I think more than anything, I think more than anything, is what is he going to be able to do when he when he's able to get out there and move around? Because if he's able to move around a little bit, I think he's going to be able to find a team that will take a chance on him. But I also think in addition to that, he's going to be able to prove to people, hey, look, I overcame the mental side of it. This is what I was able to do. Give me an opportunity and watch what I can do the following year. Um, I, I mentioned the age, right, 25 years old. If you think back to when Hayden Hurst was drafted, certainly a different circumstance, right? That's a guy that was a tight end, first round draft pick. But Hayden was just a couple months away from turning 25 when he was drafted in the first round by the Baltimore Ravens. So I think when we look at when we look at a guy like Jordan Strawn, that's one player in particular that really, to me, when we talk about pro day next week not including the five other players that took part in um, the combine in Indy. That's one player in particular that I'm very excited to see. If there's any players in particular that you guys are excited to see, let us know. Gamecock Central will be there. We'll be able to gather a bunch of interviews with these players. We'll post them immediately on Tuesday into Wednesday so you guys can hear what these guys had to say. Looking forward to being able to catch up with Spencer Rattler and what he's been able to do in the last couple months. I know Gamecock fans are very proud of him and what he's been able to accomplish going back to the NFL Combine, but even before that, going all the way back to Mobile, Alabama, having a phenomenal week at the Reese's Senior Bowl. All right, final comments here. We'll wrap things up. Hour and a half I gave you guys today. But, I mean, shoot, we had over almost a 1,000 people watching right now. So let's see. Travis says, great show, Mike. Sorry to bombard you with all my thoughts today. Travis, no problem whatsoever. Ask away. Greg with the Lady Gamecock comment. I think, let's see, want the Lady Gamecocks to have a shot at Iowa again. We'll see what happens from a basketball standpoint. Appreciate everyone that tuned in today. If you missed any of our show, we had a lot today. We had a lot, a lot, lot, lot. Talked a lot about just some of the concerns that some of you guys might have for this Gamecock team Talked a lot about the wide receiver position. Talked a little about quarterback. Talked about the corner back situation defensively. And we kind of broke down a lot of the positions. I mean, really, we talked about running backs. We talked about edge. We talked about linebackers. Talked about a lot today. So I appreciate it. If you missed any of our show, though, head on over to the Gamecock Central YouTube page where you can watch this show in its entirety for free. If you're not already a subscriber, subscribe to the Gamecock Central YouTube page. It's free. You get a little notification anytime one of these live videos drop that I do or my colleagues, Wes and Chris, they do videos as well. They have live shows. We have basketball shows. We have baseball shows next week out in Nashville. I'm sure we're going to be doing some live shows for basketball, so be on the lookout for that. We'll also have plenty of coverage throughout spring practice as well as on Tuesday when the Gamecocks take to the field for their pro day. That is Tuesday. 8.30, it's going to be kicking off. But if you're a podcast listener, you can also head on over to the Gamecock Central Podcast Network and listen to this show in its entirety as well, or any of our other Gamecock Central shows as well. That includes the 107.5 The Game shows that you can listen to on the radio. We replay them there, as well as any Garnet Trust interviews as well. And speaking about Garnet Trust, just in case you're just joining us, Big news today, Garnet Trust, Carolina Rise, they have combined. There is just one NIL now in Columbia. 
So some great news for those of you who don't want to deal with the popsicle headaches of, you know, there being two, three NILs. I think it's great. All just coming under one roof. And I, again, the number of people watching right now, it is absolutely insane. Uh, we typically don't get numbers like this on a Thursday afternoon. So I don't know what it is today, but appreciate everyone that tuned in. Got some final comments. We'll wrap up. RL says, for the people here, please like the video and subscribe. If you like the content, that helps other people see future content as well. Look at URL. We got to get you on the payroll helping us out here. Appreciate that. No, it's, we enjoy these. We enjoy doing these. So I appreciate you guys taking the time to do this. Johnny Power says, appreciate you. And I appreciate you guys. Again, appreciate everyone that tuned in today. What a monster show. I don't know what the nearly 1,000 of you are going to do now, now that we're logging off. But appreciate everyone that tuned in. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday and enjoy the rest of your weekend. And be sure to, before you sign out, got to make sure we hit the ads. Our show today is brought to you by our good friends over at Liberty Tax. With tax season right around the corner, trying to gather all your tax information to make it easier for you this tax season, give the guys over at Liberty Tax a call so you can overcome tax anxiety. 803 462 5576. And today's show is also brought to you by our good friend Clint Hammond of the Movement Mortgage. You see his logo above our heads for every. GC Live show. He's been a longtime supporter of not just GC Live, but Gamecock Central, which is why when our very own Wes Mitchell was in the process of purchasing a home, who did he call? He called Clint Hammond, and Clint Hammond was able to take care of him. That's exactly what former Gamecock quarterback and captain Perry Orth did as well when it was time to purchase a home. Give him a call at 803-771-6933. And one more note to make, mention Perry Orth. Perry will not be throwing at Pro Day this year. He's been coming back the last couple of years, but with Spencer Rattler going to be throwing out there, doesn't look like Perry Orth will be making an appearance this year. So Perry's been busy, though. Perry and his wife, Shannon, former Gamecock beach volleyball player, they just had a child recently, so I'm sure they are very busy right now. Again, appreciate everyone that tuned in today. You can go back YouTube podcasts wherever you listen to your podcast and you can go back and listen to this 90 plus minute episode where we tackle everything it felt like today with Gamecock football we'll be back at it again on Tuesday we'll have plenty of sound from South Carolina's pro day and then the next time we talk on Thursday we're going to be really focusing on spring football so be ready for that I'll see you guys next Thursday enjoy the rest of your weekend